Amen. Because even, amen, we have a couple witnesses that know that I was on internet and I was still watching from Ustream in the middle of the marriage retreat. And I, I just, I can't, I can't stay gone long. But I, and I thank and I praise God for that. Um, tonight, if you do, if you, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to um, be ministering out of the book of Job, out of the book of Job. And we're going to be looking at Job chapter 3, starting at verse 20. Job chapter 3, verse 20. If you have your Bibles with you, if not, raise your hand and someone will come and bring you a Bible. We'll make sure that you have a Bible. Job chapter 3, verse 20. And we're going to be looking down to verse 26. Job chapter 3, verse 20. When you have it, say amen. All right. Let's take a look at this and let's read this together. It says, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul? Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery? Wherefore? Where, where do we receive that light? Where does that light come from to him that is in misery? And then it goes on to say, And life unto the bitter in soul. Come on, verse 21 which longs for death, but it comes not, and digs for it more than for hidden treasures. Verse 22, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Verse 23, why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God has hedged in? 24, for my sign comes before I eat. My roarings are poured out like waters. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Yet trouble came came. I, I want to minister to you tonight out of the topic, it's only a crisis. It's only a crisis. It's only a crisis. Look at your neighbor sitting next to you and tell him, neighbor, it's only a crisis. Come on, turn to somebody else and tell him, neighbor, it's only a crisis. One of the things that you're going to have to learn is that if you're going to walk according to the word of God, you're going to have to learn how to walk in the kingdom and not according to your flesh. Because we as citizens of the kingdom don't respond to situations like everyone else responds. Let me give you some statistics to show you what I'm talking about because I think it's very important that you hear this. Between the year of 2008 and 2009, the suicide rate in the United States rose by 2.4% with the reported 36,909 suicide deaths, according to a report by the CDC. In 2008, 13.4% of individuals who committed suicide experienced job and financial problems. Another report by the CDC revealed in August of 2011. The overall rate was 11.3% suicide deaths. I'm sorry, 11.3 suicide deaths per 100,000 people. An estimated 11 attempted suicides occur per, per every suicide death. I know right now you might be thinking, Pastor, why in the world are you talking about suicide at Bible study this, this day? Because you have to understand the reason for suicide. Let me first give you the definition of crisis. Somebody look at your neighbor and say it's only a crisis. Crisis is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Can I say that again? The definition of crisis is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Am I talking to anybody today that has actually come up on a situation where you have felt the intensity of a difficult situation, some terrible news, trouble, or danger that comes knocking at your door? Am I talking to anybody today? Why is that? Because crisis comes to everyone. I need you to understand tonight, just because you're a Christian doesn't and exempt you from a crisis. How many of you know that when you open up your mouth and confess Christ being your Lord and Savior, you're 
actually saying, bring on the heat. Am I talking to anybody tonight? When you understand that, you'll understand, be careful of what you ask for. I'm learning now that when I pray to God, I'm very detailed in what I pray. I, when I ask God, God, give me patience, I let him know, God, give me patience, but I need the, the patience to come at a slow pace. There's a difference between turning around and receiving water. You can receive it in an IV drip, or you can receive it from an entire water hose. Can I talk to somebody tonight? Some of you have received the patience from what I would consider a fire hydrant. God didn't do it slowly. He just let it come all at you. And when you understand the reason God lets things come at you at a quick pace is because he's got something for you to do very quickly. Am I talking to somebody tonight? I'm talking to somebody, and I need somebody to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's only a crisis. Uh, we're about to turn it up a notch because sometimes when we talk to folks in church, folks ain't really paying attention to what you're saying. So I'm going to now give you the opportunity to say it like you really want to say it. Look at your neighbor right in the eyes and say, neighbor, dry your eyes. Stop your crying. Stop your complaining. Stop your murmuring. It's only a crisis. Come on, somebody. When you will learn how to embrace your crisis, you'll understand that the crisis that God has you in is not designed to kill you, but it's only designed to make you stronger. Do I have anybody that needs a witness tonight? Where would you be if it had not been for God? How many times has God brought you through danger seen and unseen? How many times did you stay up late at night thinking you was about to lose your mind but the thing that kept you up late at night the thing that Job said the thing that I feared most has come upon me am I talking to anybody tonight I'm here to let you know as a witness that if God was allowing it to become on your life it's because he's trying to get something out of your life look at your neighbor again and say neighbor I hope you're away because it's only a crisis this message might not be for you right now, but if you stick around long enough, uh, you're going to have to use this one day. Uh, it might not even be 24 hours. Uh, it might not even be 24 minutes when you walk out. So you better remind yourself it's only a crisis. Uh, when I come into difficult situations, it's only a crisis. Uh, when I come up into some dangerous situations, it's only a crisis. When things are coming against me that I can't handle, I'm going to look it straight in the face and tell it it's only a crisis. And y'all keep saying, Pastor, why you keep telling us to look at each other and say it's only a crisis? Baby, I'm trying to give you practice because if you don't learn how to say it now, when you're all by yourself, when nobody else is around, you're going to have to look at your neighbor and the only neighbor might be yourself. Do I have any witnesses? Sometimes you got to learn like David said. I've got to encourage myself. Have you ever had to stand flat-footed when nobody else is around, when you can't get a word in, can't get a telephone call through and you got to learn how to encourage. Say it with me again. Let's get some practice. It's only a crisis. See, y'all, y'all messed it up because y'all know Mondays, usually I don't have a microphone in my hand. Y'all know when I got the headset on, we go in teach mode. But something about when the microphone goes to my hand, I got to go in preach mode. And then to turn around and warm it up and take it to another level. I didn't preach yesterday, so I got to get this thing out. Somebody say it's only a crisis. Good God Almighty. The definition, once again, of a crisis is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Loss of jobs, loss of finances, loss of loved ones can be considered a crisis. But the ultimate reason that these things become a crisis it's not the loss of money. It's not the loss of friends. It's not the loss of finances. It's not the loss of things. But it's a loss of hope. It's a loss of hope. Crisis or troubles are God's designed prob- problems to attract, watch this, God's favor upon your life. Can I say that again? Crisis or troubles are God's designed problems. Say that with me. God's design problems. See, when you have a, a crisis in your life, can I, can I submit to you tonight that it didn't catch God off guard? 
when you got that letter in the mail, it might have been a surprise to you. When you got that telephone call, it might have been a surprise to you. When them folks turned around and told you that they was laying you off, it might have been a surprise to you. When you called and checked your bank account and there was no money in your account, it might have been a surprise to you. But I'll submit to you that God knew that that was going to come from the very beginning. Somebody say it's only a crisis. I need you to stay with me because John chapter 1 verse 3, I want you to look at it with me. John chapter 1 verse 3. John 1 3. Glory to God. It says all things were made by him. Somebody say all things. Pastor, you mean all things? I mean everything. You mean, you mean the, the bad things? I mean all things. You mean the things that I don't understand? I mean all things. The, the things that I have answered, all things. Somebody say all things. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was what? Made. Uh, let me just go ahead and tell you that if you're going through something right now, it was made by God. If you've got something that you cannot control, can I tell you that that uncontrollable thing was made by him, through him, and for him? Uh, see, when you get the right mentality and perspective of who God is, uh, you'll realize that anything that God does uh, is designed to bring you closer to him. Uh, can I submit once again uh, that if you weren't going through anything right now, you probably wouldn't be spending time in prayer right now. Uh, sometimes God lets things come against you uh, so it brings you closer to him. Uh, oh, come on and get real with me tonight. Uh, if you didn't have no problems and no troubles in your life, uh, you probably wouldn't spend no time in prayer. Uh, you probably wouldn't come to Bible study. You probably wouldn't even come to church. But it seems like when crisis comes a knocking, we run to the church. We run to prayer. We spend time in our word. Am I talking to anybody tonight? And when you really get real with God, you realize, God, this crisis was designed for me. And I hear the spirit of the Lord say, tell them that they're correct. I won't put any more on them than they can bear. But that doesn't exempt you from having to carry some things. There's some times where you have to learn just how to, somebody say, trust God. You got to learn to trust God. I, I, I'm getting to the point that I'm realizing the difference, my brother, between trusting God and having faith in God and hoping in God. See, there's a difference between the two. See, when you are hoping in God, you're hoping that he'll do something, but something in the back of your mind is saying, God, are you really going to do it? Somewhere down the line, when you're sick and you're afflicted, your hope says, God, I don't know if you will. But my Bible says that any man that comes unto him must first believe that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So when you understand that, God, when I come to you, it's not I'm coming to you in hope. I'm coming to you in faith. What is faith? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God, I don't have to see you do it. I just know you're going to do it. So I'm not hoping you're going to do it. I'm thanking you right now for getting it done. Who am I talking to tonight? So when you're in the midst of your situation and crisis is all up in your business, baby, instead of me hoping I'm coming out, you learn how to start praising God because you're already out. When you get to that point, your faith is down. God, oh my. Somebody look at your name and say, stop hoping and start believing. You ain't got to wish that this thing is going to change. You got to know that it's going to change. Didn't God bring you out of it the last time? How many more times does God have to show up for you to believe that he is the one that will diligently reward you? Come on, John 1, 3. Look at this. Somebody say all things. So if all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Your situation was made by him. Sitting up in the hospital. Two blown out knees. Can't walk on all kind of medication. Doctor saying, you ain't going to be able to walk for a good six months. I had a chance at that moment to sit there and do what Job's wife taught him to do. It's this to me that we can turn around and we can quote all kind of scriptures all throughout the Bible and folks will scratch their head, but some, for some reason when we get to Job, everybody know Job. 
because everybody can relate with the job is do I have anybody that's gone through some job experiences have I am I talking to anybody that's had to lose some stuff has anybody in here had to lose a job had to lose a spouse had to lose some money am I talking to any jobs in the house right now and it's interesting, interesting that when things are going so well it seems like that's when crisis comes I'm here tonight to tell you it's only a crisis because at that time when you know a crisis is coming you got to be careful who you surround yourself with it's not when you get into the crisis that you find out who your real friends are baby you better know who your friends are before the crisis because when you're standing in the middle of that crisis you better know that you got some folks around you that's going to encourage you that's going to establish you that's going to tell you don't quit that's going to tell you don't give up the towel that's going to tell you you're going to make it do I have any real friends in the house tonight I don't need no folk coming around me and discouraging me I can do bad all by myself I need some folk that can uplift me I need some folk that can pray for me I need some folk that can pick up the phone and call me and say although you going through God is not going am I talking to anybody tonight we, we don't need no Job wives tonight we don't need no folks that just because they having a bad day they turn around and try to make your day just as bad we don't need no folks just because of the fact that they ain't got no friends. They don't want you to have no friends either. I don't need nobody coming to me and say, won't you just curse God and die? Baby, if it wasn't for God, I would have been there. So that's the reason I can't curse you. Because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be living right now. When you can turn around and you can see that you're going through a crisis, Sometimes God puts you in that situation so you can show other folks how to come out of the crisis. See, when you got the right mentality of the king, you'll realize that, God, if you put me in it, that means you're trying to get something to me. If you put me in it, that means that you're trying to prove something to somebody else. If you put me in it, there's a lesson in this thing for me to learn. Your job is to learn your lesson while you're in the crisis so when you come out the crisis, you can know who Christ is. Somebody just missed that. When you go through the crisis, when you come out the crisis, you'll know who Christ is. See, some of us say that we know him. Some of us say we love him. Some of us say that we trust him. Some of us say that we have faith in him. But that's before the crisis. But my question is, is your knowing, your trust, and your faith the same when you get in the crisis? Can you still give God a praise in the valley that you was giving him on top of the mountain? Can you praise God like you got a million dollars in the bank account when you got a million dollar debt? Can you praise God? When the boss is coming and telling you ain't got a job, like he just got through praising him when he said you got a promotion. My question is, what do you do in the middle of your crisis? What do you do when folks walk out of your life? What do you do when things ain't going your way? Do you fold up your tent and go home? Do you start now murmuring and complaining and finding fault with everything and everybody? Do you go around pointing the figure to everybody and showing everybody else where you're the victim and everybody is against you when the crisis comes? Somebody say it's only a crisis. Come on, I need somebody to say it with me tonight. It's only a crisis. I need you to get that in your spirit because before we get out of here tonight, you're going to make it up in your mind that this is only a crisis. I don't know why God's taking me here tonight, but there's about two or three people that came in They're right in the middle of your crisis. If I'm talking to you tonight, you need to stand to your feet right now and shout, it's only a crisis. You need to let the enemy know that I'm not going to give up in this situation. I'm not throwing the towel in in this situation. I refuse to give up on God now. I tried it without him. I tried to do this thing without him. But tonight I choose to believe God at his word. Bible says watch this. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Everything that happens in life is by the permissive will of God. What do you mean by that? I mean that everything that is happening in your life, God has allowed it to happen. God said, yes, try it. Try it. You mean it to me? Tell me that God allowed this? Yeah, God said, yes, let it be so. Let it be so. 
But see, sometimes when you are walking around with the mentality that it's all about you, you can't figure that thing out because you think that you're so holy, so saved, so sanctified and got so much Holy Ghost. How, God, would you allow this to happen to me? Somewhere you got to make it up in your mind that you will realize, why not me? God needs somebody in the earth that can carry his glory. God needs somebody in the earth that he knows that he can trust. God is looking throughout the earth and saying, who can I trust with this crisis? Who do I know that won't give up on me? Who do I know that will keep their praise? Baby, you can take my money. You can take my finances. You can even have my friends. But I refuse to let anybody have my praise. I'm a praise him when I'm up. I'm a praise praise him when I'm down. I'm going to praise him when I'm going through. I said I was going to praise you before the crisis. I'm going to praise you while I'm in the crisis. But when I come out, I'm still going to praise him. You better high five your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's only a crisis. My good God. Uh, uh, this ain't the time to throw in the towel. It's only a crisis. Come on, let's back it back up for a minute and define a crisis. A crisis is a time. Somebody say a time of intense difficulty. Uh, baby, if you ain't going through nothing, uh, you might want to check your salvation. Uh, if you ain't been tried on nothing, uh, you might want to check, are you really saved? Uh, because sometimes uh, the enemy is not after you, uh, but he's after what's inside of you. Uh, you said you had faith. Uh, you said you was going to trust him. You said you was going to believe him. So now the enemy comes in and says, let me see if you really mean what you say. Come on, he ain't after you. He's after what's inside of you. And that's the reason why. You can have my money. Because I came into this world and I didn't have no money. You can have my friends. Because I came into this world and I didn't have no friends. But baby, one thing, I made up my mind. You can't have. You can't have my praise. Just want to know if there's anybody tonight that refuses to give up their praise. You can go bankrupt tonight. You can have my car tonight. You can have my house tonight. But you can't have my praise. Because when I didn't have no money, I still had a praise. When I didn't have no friends, I still had a praise. And one thing I realize, I can be broke. But as long as I got a praise, I'm going to make it through. Do I have anybody in tonight that came in here with a praise? You might not have two nickels to rub together, but baby, if you got two hands, I dare you to put them together and go to clapping your hands and giving God some glory. Come on and give him some glory. Come on and really give him glory. Come on and say it. It's only a crisis. Good God Almighty, uh, it's only a crisis. It's only a crisis. Come on, stay with me for just a second. Uh, uh, come turn with me to Psalms 34. We're going to look at verse 17. Psalms 34, verse 17. Psalms 34, verse 17. Good Lord. Psalms 34, 17. Come on, y'all there? How does your Bible read in the beginning? The who? Sinners? The world? Hustlers? Dope dealers? Drug dealers? Pimps and prostitutes? He said the what? The righteous cry. See, he didn't say the righteous cry out. He said the righteous cry. I need somebody to catch this tonight. See, there's certain situations that God allows to come into your life to cause you to cry. God, why would you allow this to cause me to cry? I want to say it in another way that you could probably understand it because I'm sure this has been some of your prayers. Uh, late in that midnight hour, uh, when you cry, God, why is it so much pain? God, why is this hurt so bad? 
God, why can't I get over this thing? God, why is it I can't just lay down and put my face on the pillow and go to sleep? Why is it I got to keep on tossing and turning? Why is it I got to take something to go to sleep and take something to get up? Why do I got to take something to walk? Why do I got to take something to think? Why do I got to take something to make it through? Every time I think I'm past it, it seems like it comes right back again. God, why are you causing me to cry? He said, the righteous cry. But this is what I love about God. He just don't leave you in that place of crying. And he says, and the Lord hears. Let me tell you something. There's not one tear that you have ever shed that God did not see fall from your face. Can I, can I say that again in a way that you'll really grab hold of this? Every time that you open up your heart to the God, he receives what you give to him. But just because he doesn't respond at that moment doesn't mean that he doesn't hear you. See, what God is not going to do is he's not going to allow us to manipulate him. And what we think is, we think just because I'm crying, God, you should respond. See, let me, let me share it another way so you can really catch all this. Uh, me and my wife, we got, we got five kids. And we've got an 11-year-old now. And back about 10 years ago when he was probably about seven, eight months, he had this thing about when we were laying in his bed, he would begin to cry. Seven months, he'd cry. Every time he'd cry, we'd jump up and we'd run and we'd pick him up. We'd pat him. We'd burp him. We'd milk him. We'd pat him some more and put him back in bed. Eight months, he'd cry again. We'd get up. We'd pick him up. We'd pat him. We'd burp him. We'd milk him. We'd put him back to bed. A year. He crying again. We'd pat him. We'd burp him. We'd milk him. We'd put him back to bed. I'm laying in bed one night and I'm thinking to myself, one year and he's still crying and we still responding. I just had this visual of him being five years old laying up in my bed with me and his mama and his feet as big as mine and I'm patting him and I'm burping him and I'm milking this big old baby I said that devil is a lie so about a year he woke up in the middle of the night crying his mom looked over at me and she said what are we going to do I said we ain't going to do nothing we hear him but that doesn't mean we're supposed to respond to him because what we're doing is we're actually teaching him bad behaviors. So what we're going to do is we're going to let him cry until he realizes that just because you're crying doesn't mean that we're supposed to be responding. And after a while, he stopped crying and he put his big boy pants on and realized that my tears is not going to manipulate you. So I better learn how to go up and get some sleep. For those of you that didn't catch it, we got too many saints of God walking around in church wanting to be patted, wanting to be burnt, wanting to be milked, and ain't grown up. I'm here to let you know, just because you're crying, it's not an excuse to have God respond to you. Pastor hurt my feelings. Sister, 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 sister didn't even speak to me this morning. They turned around and called everybody's name but my name this morning. I did the same thing that they did, and I stayed longer than they did. They didn't even recognize me. Just because you're crying, don't give me an excuse to respond to your tears. Sometimes. God going to turn around and sit in heaven and you down in earth. Ah, ah, ah. 
angels in heaven, they turn and say, Lord, don't you hear them? He says, I hear them. I hear you. You don't think I knew that you got laid off? You don't think I know you ain't got enough money to pay that bill? You don't think I know your back is hurting and your legs and feet is hurting? You think I don't know that the doctors don't have a diagnosis that they can turn around and bring a cure to you? When are you going to stop crying to me and start crying out to me? Can, can I say that again? When are you going to learn to stop crying to me and learn to cry out to me? See, when you learn the reason for your crisis, you'll learn that your crisis is to draw you closer to him. See, I'm not calling out to God for you, God, for me to manipulate you and get what I want. My cry is, God, let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So if that means I've got to go through this, I'm not going to cry. I'm going to put my big boy pants on and I'm going to walk this thing out. If i got to endure to the very end, somewhere you got to let the devil know. If i got to walk the rest of this walk in pain the rest of my life, with this on my side for the rest of my life, if it's going to be like a thorn in my side, Lord, I know you're going to give me the grace to make it sufficient. Somebody better tell the devil tonight huh? Is this all you got? Huh? Is this all you got to throw on me? Huh? Is this all you got to continue to harass me with? Well baby this is only a crisis I know I didn't upset about four or five of y'all Y'all turned around and want me to give y'all a different message tonight Y'all want me to tell you that just because you're crying God gonna come and deliver We can't get to deliverance until we understand how to get delivered God's wanting to deliver you so that way when you come out You'll learn how to stay out See, some of you, if God brought you out right now, you'd be right back into it next week. If God delivered you from that cocaine and them drugs and that alcohol, you'd be smoking and getting high next week. If God delivered you from that man, you'd be right back with that man next week. If God delivered you from being in poverty next month, you'd be broke again. God says, until you learn the lesson through the crisis, I can't deliver you. Now, 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 look over at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's only a crisis. Now, now we can get to it because I think y'all getting it now. The reason your crisis is so long because you still ain't passed the test in the crisis. See, God, God's not like, thank God for, thank God for our school system. Amen. We need to pray for it. We need to pray for the school system. But God's not like the school system. And just because, watch this, you 15 year old and you're still in the fourth grade and they feel sorry for you so they go ahead and put you in the fifth. Then turn around and hurt somebody's feelings. You drive to school and you're still in elementary. Parking next to the teachers. Getting out and going to class. They turn around and have a, uh, a meeting of the teacher's conference and they say, ain't he big enough yet? What do we need to do with him? And one of the teachers get a bright idea. He's so big, just go ahead and pass him on. God's not like that. You can be 50 years old still in kindergarten in heaven. God don't care how old you are. You better learn to get the lesson while you're in the class. And once you pass the lesson, now you're ready to pass the class. And once you pass the class, now he'll graduate you to the next class. Or let me say it another way. Once you pass the crisis, he'll graduate you to the next crisis. See, we think just because we came out of a crisis, we are no longer supposed to go through another crisis. Haven't you ever figured this thing out that your crisis only seem to be getting bigger? The bigger the crisis means the bigger your knowledge. <sighs> didn't I tell you that God said I'm not going to put more on you than you can so if you're going through anything right now that is big that's because God says you passed the last crisis with flying colors so you prepare for this new crisis 
Somebody should have got your praise on right there. <laughs> Somebody should have said, y'all would have known where you're at with your revelation because if you would have realized what I just said, you would have been giving God some praise right about there. Why? Because if God has got you through something and taking you into something, that's because he can trust you with what he's putting you through. How many of you by a show of hands is going through a big crisis right now? Come on, put your hands up. Come on. You ain't even got to tell on yourself. I didn't ask what it was. I just said, was you going through one? Okay, so if you're going through a big crisis right now, that means that God has got something real big for you. The size of your crisis determines, determines the size of your blessing. Come on. See, I'm just throwing stuff in while y'all are talking, but stay with me. Somebody told me, Pastor, you say stuff so fast, by the time when you turn around and we caught that last one, you on to something else. So I'm going to slow back down again. I'm going to say this one again so y'all can catch this one. I like them glasses, by the way. The size of your crisis is the size of your blessing. So my question is, once again, how many of you are going through a big crisis right now? How many of you are going through a big crisis? Show of hands. Hold on for a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Y'all you ain't slick. Y'all ain't slick. More hands went up that time. Everybody turn around. I guess my crisis is pretty big. Now you want what's on the other side of the crisis. Be careful. Because he says, the righteous cry and what? The Lord heareth a process. He's hearing you, but he's wanting you to go through the process and delivereth another process. E-A-E-T-H on the end of a word means process. All right? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that a process is continuous. So he's hearing you continuously. He's delivering you continuously. Let me just go ahead and put this out here so then that way we can turn around and shame the devil because some of you have gone through some processes and I just want to make it very clear. Here's the teachings of Cornerstone Family Worship Center so that everybody understands that just because God has delivered you doesn't mean he stopped delivering you. That means he's continuously delivering. So that means when I come down to the altar and I give my life to God, am I talking too fast for anyone? Just because of the fact I might fall tomorrow does not mean that I got to go back and start all over again. That means I just need to get up from where I fell and keep moving. So now when folks is turning around and trying to tell me, I thought you were saved. Uh, baby, I am saved. Just keep watching me and you'll see how saved I am. Because if I wasn't saved, I'd probably give you a piece of my mind right about now. That's how you know how saved I am, that God is still saving me. Uh, y'all don't want to be real tonight. Y'all, y'all, don't, y'all want to be sanctified and holy tonight. Have you ever had to hold your mouth and thank God for saving you? Have you ever had to keep your hands up under your armpits so you can turn around and say, God, save these hands so I don't go land them on somebody? Thank God for the process. No, 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 y'all neighbors say, pray for my pastor. Pray for him. Pray for him. Pray for him. He on one tonight. He on one. He said, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of what? All your troubles he's going to deliver you from. But he's not just trying to come and take you out of the trouble before you find out what the trouble was for. Every situation that God puts you in, it's got a purpose and a plan for it. When we understand that, we start focusing on the crisis. We now start looking for the lesson in the crisis. Ooh, man. I just felt about two or three people just get released and get a breakthrough right about there. Because now you start to realize, God, it wasn't the fact that I did something wrong that I'm in the crisis. It's the fact that I did something right that you allowed the crisis. Mm. See, it's something about when you go into the crisis uh, that the devil begins to talk. Uh, can I just go ahead and remind you that the Bible says uh, that the devil, who is the accuser of the brother, who is the father of our lies, and when he opens up his mouth, the one thing he can't do is tell the truth. Uh, so every time he tells you something, you might as well know he's lying. So when he goes around and say, where's your God at now? That's a lie to let you know he's right there. When he tells you you must have done something wrong, you can thank God that the devil told you because it's confirmation that you did something right I've learned how to use the devil to really be a confirmation in my life see that's a nugget for somebody right there that's a nugget right there that's a nugget for somebody here's, here's, here's a wisdom key right here for you here's a wisdom key when the devil begins to speak listen very closely to what he is saying 
Because if you listen to what he's saying, he's actually telling you what God has already said. Do you remember in the garden when the devil, the accuser of the brother and the father of all lies comes to Eve? He goes to Eve and he says, did God say? He was reminding Eve of what God had already said. And he says, if you eat from that tree, you're not going to surely die. Lie. For God knows that if you eat of that tree, you will be like him. Another lie. Because the part that the devil didn't tell her was before I ate of the fruit, I was already like him. Didn't he come back and say that I will create man in my image and after I have my likeness? So when he created he and them, he created them like him. So because I was like him, the devil had to come and lie to Eve to tell her she wasn't already like him. Start using the words of the devil to confirm what God has already said. You're going to be broke all your life. Somebody need to go to shouting and giving God glory. Money's about to come because the devil's got to be lying. You're going to be sick all your life. You better go to giving God glory. My healing is on the way. You ain't going to get that job. You better give God a praise because you are about to get a financial. I, I could probably go around this room right now and pass out the microphone and say, what did God, what did God say to you? And you're going to tell me. And then I'm going to say, what did the devil say to you? And you're going to probably find out that it was the direct opposite. And it's interesting to me that people listen more to what the devil says than what God says. People put more stock, mother, into what the devil says versus what God says. If you're going to put stock into what the devil says, at least know what he's saying. He's lying. Y'all getting help tonight? If you can help, turn to your neighbor and say it's only a crisis. Now look at your other neighbor on the other side and say, neighbor, stop your crying. It's only a crisis. All right, because he said the righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivered them out of them all. Come on, verse 18. Look at this. Watch this. And the Lord is nigh. Come on, somebody say nigh. Unto them that are what? Brokenhearted. Do I have any brokenhearted saints in the house right now? Has, have you ever had your heart broken? Have you ever turned around and been disappointed? Have you ever been in a situation where you was just believing and trusting? It seemed like right at that moment your heart got broke. Come on, it's all right to admit it every once in a while. It's all right to go ahead and admit your heart's been broken because God says, I dwell amongst them with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. When your heart has been broken and your spirit feels like it's nowhere in you, God says, that's when I'm the closest to you. So sometimes the reason that you are going through the crisis is because God is trying to get close to you. Let me say it in another way. Sometimes God allows the crisis so he can bring you closer to Christ. Come on, somebody say this with me. My broken heart, my contrite spirit draws the presence of God into my situation. Good God Almighty. Let's say that again. My broken heart, my contrite spirit draws the presence of God into my situation. If you're going through anything right now that's causing your heart to be broken, huh, you need to start giving God some glory because that means that God is on the way. Huh? If your spirit is contrite right now, confused, you don't know if you're up or down, huh? don't know if you're coming or going, you better give God some glory right about now huh? because I let you know huh, that help is on the way. Huh? It was all right when you had a little bit of hope. Huh? It was all right when folks was praying and saying, let me go ahead and be real, because I got to go ahead and be real. Huh? Isn't it interesting that when you got things going on in the church, huh, and you can't talk to nobody, huh, and you go and try to tell somebody what you're really going through, and the first response, they say, go ahead and pray about it. I was praying. That's the reason I'm coming to you. That ain't no answer. Just trust the Lord. Everything going to be all right. I already know that. Quit giving me them church answers and give me something that I can use. Go ahead and let me know because of my broken heart and my contrite spirit. He draws nigh unto me. Next time somebody come up to you and turn around and want to give you their sob story about how bad their life is. If you ain't got a sob story to turn around and share with them of your own testimony, borrow mine. 
This is how you can break it down. Start off by saying it like this. I completely understand what you're going through. But because of the fact I can't turn around and muster up my own testimony, let me borrow my pastor's testimony. Here my pastor was as a man that was making all kind of money. God came to him and told him that he was supposed to leave his job, leave his finances, leave everything. He lost everything. Houses, cars, turned around and got things repoed and foreclosed on. And at that moment when God says go into the ministry, he turned around and said okay. Six months right after he said okay, he was playing basketball, blew out both his knees, was sitting up in the hospital, couldn't walk. Doctors told him he wasn't going to walk for six months. After that, God came in 10 days later, healed him, raised him up, began to walk. He turned around and thought everything was going to be okay. Instead of everything being okay, folks got to leaving the church, walking out, saying that he was teaching all kind of doctrine, and at that point, he thought he was about to lose his mind. He had to fall out, cry, and not to God, but had to cry out to God because his heart was broke and his spirit was contrite. If you can't get your own testimony, borrow mine. Because right about that time, somebody can probably look at you and say, well, what would your pastor do? That's when you look at him and say, come on Sunday and come find out. Because he walking, he talking, he preaching, he believing, he still giving God glory. One thing they couldn't take from my pastor is they couldn't take his praise. If you can't tell nobody else nothing else, tell them straight in their face, I don't care what I'm going through. They can have it all, but they cannot have mine. Somebody say with me tonight, it's only a crisis. It's only a crisis. Y'all going to keep saying, well, well, Pastor, why you keep sharing your testimony? Because you're not sharing yours. Ooh, boy. Let that word right there hit you. If you're the one asking, why every time you get up, you share your testimony? Because you ain't sharing yours. See, if you were sharing yours, I wouldn't have time to share mine. Because folks ain't trying to hear mine. They're trying to hear. Good God Almighty. Can, can I borrow it? Can I borrow it? See, Pastor Jamal, I told you, I, I can't stay away from church. I might be gone, but I ain't out the house. So let me give you all a word of advice. For all y'all that don't think Pastor watching, Y'all walking past the camera like. <laughs> I, I see y'all. <laughs> Folks be doing that. They be doing it. They, be, they, they really be doing it. They don't think I be watching. Sometimes I be back in my office and the camera be on. And folks be walking by like. Yeah, so I'm watching you. Just because I'm out the church don't mean I'm out the church. And I got a chance yesterday to really watch a lot of the sermon and then come back today and watch the full sermon. One of the things Pastor Jamal said yesterday was so powerful is he said God will bring you from your call to take you to your assignment. Don't be late for your appointment. And see, the problem with it is, is you spending so much time dealing with the crisis that you're forgetting that God has not got your crisis for your destination. If you want to go to, you got to be willing to go. Can I say it again? If you want to go to, you got to be willing to go. See, the problem with it is, is you never ask God the question, what do I have to go? You have to go through the crisis. I'm just going to piggyback off of Pastor Jamal. So to get from the call, see, see y'all need to turn around and y'all need to go back and y'all need to go ahead and let Pastor Jamal know, Pastor, if you're going to preach, preach the whole sermon. <laughs> Pastor Jamal kind of act like, act like God acts sometimes. God will show us the beginning and the end. He just don't show us everything in the middle. See, what Pastor Jamal told you yesterday is that God was going to bring you from your call and take you to your appointment. The part he didn't tell you was what you were going to have to go through to get to the appointment. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. Bad pastor. 
set the saints up. It been walked out yesterday. Shall know the appointment, the appointment, the appointment. Excited. I had folks emailing me and sending me Facebook messages. I'm ready for my appointment. I said, oh, Jesus. I better warn the saints. Because what Pastor Jamal did not tell you was to get to the appointment. You got to go through the crisis. Somebody say it's only a crisis today. Come on, don't get focused on the crisis because it's only a crisis. Stay focused on the appointment. Stay focused on what God's taking you to, but don't get caught up in it. God's trying to bring you from that place to take you to a place, but he's trying to take you through the crisis. Come on, last passage. I'm going to get you out of here. Watch this. Okay. I got to forewarn you that whenever I tell you this is going to be the last passage, there's always a part A, B, and C to the last passage. So here's last passage A. James 5, 10 and 11. We're going to read this one real quick. Watch this. You ready? James 5, 10 and 11 says, Take my brother and the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. So you need to take them as an example of what they had to go through. Amen? They knew their appointment. They knew their assignment. They knew what they were called from. But they had to be used as an example. Why? Because they went through suffering and they had affliction. Somebody say crisis. Behold, take a look. We count them happy which endure. Somebody say endure. Uh huh. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. Come on, somebody. Can I go back and say that again? You have heard of the patience of Job uh, to get through the crisis. It's very important that you understand a couple things you have to learn how to do. One, somebody say endure. Two, you got to have patience. Uh huh. So when you learn how to endure and have patience, you'll get the same ending that Job got. Come on, somebody. Because for some of you that don't understand the ending of Job's story, I told you for the ending, you're going to have to have a part A. But to get to the B, you got to have patience and learn to endure. Oh, my. So tonight, I need to take you to the end so you can see the end of Job's story. Because if Job would have gave up, he would have never got to the end. And some of you right now, I'm coming to encourage you not to give up and have patience and endure. Somebody say to the end. Why is it important for you to endure the end? Job chapter 42, verse 10. Come on, go with me if you would, please. Job 42. Good, 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 good. Job 42. You there? You there? When you get there, say amen. All right. I- I'm going to read verse 10, and we're going to go down to verse 12. This is part B. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. My good God. See, Job understood something. Job understood the whole entire time I was in the crisis, it took me 42 chapters to quit praying for myself and start praying for my friends. Some of you don't even realize the reason you're still in your crisis is because you're still praying for yourself. But when you learn how to use the crisis to now start praying for your friends, you'll get the same end that Job got. Can I just unlock some of you out of your crisis tonight? Take your focus off of you and start now praying for somebody else. Somebody said that was part B. But that was for free. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave somebody say Job twice. Somebody say twice. Do I have anybody right now that is tired of not getting what God said was for you? The reason why you can't get what's for you is because you don't understand the principle of the twice. Here's part B. Part B is when you start praying for your friends, God now starts to trust you with your things. Because he knows that you can be trusted with the things. He can now not give you just what was taken, but he can give you what was taken and then some. Why is that important? Because now it's not just going to be for you, but it's going to be for you and your friends. See, anytime God really blesses you, blessings don't mean I've got enough. 
blessings mean I got more than enough. So I tell folks here at Cornerstone, when you say you bless, I put my hand out because you should have enough for me and you. How you doing? I'm blessed. Praise God. How you doing? I'm blessed. Praise God. If we bless, then come on, let's share the blessings. Because he said he got twice as much. So if you got something taken from you, that means you got double for your trouble. That means you came through the crisis, understand what the crisis was for. Somebody say, I'm blessed. Now, if I stop there, watch this. We can end it. But we need verse 11. Come on. Come on. Verse 11. Then came them unto him all the brethren and all his sisters. Ain't it interesting that when you get blessed, everybody starts showing up? That's when you really know you're blessed when folks start showing up on the job and folks come calling you. Folks turn around and start showing up your door. Folks you ain't seen in years. Where you come from? I came from there to here to get my blessing. funny how folks turn around and get blessed and all of a sudden want to change their number. And you wonder why you can't hold on to your blessing. Because you didn't understand the reason for the blessing. The blessing wasn't for you. Oh my. Whoo my. Yeah. Y'all going to get me up in here all night long. Come on. He said and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before. Where were all these people during the first 41 chapters? I just read about 41 of his three friends. Now all of a sudden his brothers and sisters and all of his acquaintances show up. And all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. He didn't turn around and shut the doors on them. Hospitality. He said, come on, I got enough for everybody. Come on in. And it says, and they bemoaned him and covered him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money. Look at this. Look at this. Somebody say Kingdom kingdom they showed up now he had already received twice as much but see when fo- oh my god I heard the Holy Ghost just turn around and give me a word for somebody tonight when you really are blessed and God has now taken you through the process of how to get blessed folks see the blessing on your life they'll sow into your life y'all, y'all didn't want to catch that one y'all didn't want to catch that one see when you know how you got blessed and understand the principles of blessing and what to do with the blessing now folks from all over will come and sow into your life because they see that's blessed soil I don't know what he talking about what are he talking about folks going to sow in my life you just basically tell me you still don't understand the principles of blessing because folks know if they give you a dollar you're going to spend it. But folks know a blessed man, if he gets a dollar, he's going to go and invest the dollar and bring me back two dollars. Y'all act like y'all been saved all y'all's life. Y'all been out in the streets long enough to hustle. You know good and well you turn around. Am I talking to some real folk tonight? Am I talking to some folks that turn around and flip some money before? I told you, Pastor, ain't been saying this whole life. All right, for the, for those of y'all that don't want to turn around and act like y'all been out in them streets, y'all know good and well you turn around and give somebody for their food stamps. Uh, Nigel Davis, he coming down my street now. He coming down my street now. Amen. Amen. Turn around and gave him ten dollars. They gave me twenty dollars back in food stamps. Same principle. Inflation, inflation. <laughs> Boy, I love Cornerstone. And it says that he comforted them over all the evil that they did. And every man also gave him a piece of money. And everyone an earring of gold. Just turn around and start a blessing, Job. You believe in blessed like that? Here, come on, bless me. Come on, we're going to go. Verse 12, and I'm going to get you out of here. So the Lord blessed, somebody say the Lord bless. The latter end of Job more than his beginning now here's part C 
Here's part C. When we're getting ready to read verse 12 once again. Now when we get to Job, I need you to take Job's name out and put your name in. All right? The reason we're about to do this is because I need you to see what God sees. And when you put your name in there, you're going to see that God's not concerned about the beginning. He's not concerned about the middle. He's only concerned about your... All right, now that I got y'all where we need to go. Come on, part C, are you ready? And the Bible says, so the Lord bless the latter end of... Come on, of... Y'all ain't saying like y'all really mean it. So the Lord bless... The latter end of one more time. So the Lord bless the latter end of more. Somebody shall more shall more than his beginning. For he had fourteen. How many of you know that God wants to bless your end, not your beginning? How many of you know that God wants to bless your end, not your middle? So whatever you're going through right now, all I can give you tonight, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's only a crisis. Just make it through your crisis. Come on, somebody tell them, just make it through your crisis. High five somebody right now and tell them, get over it. Come on, high five them and tell them, dry up your tears. High five them and tell them, stop your crying. Stop your whining. Stop your complaining. Because it's only a crisis. Come on, questions, comments, concerns, let's talk. It's only a crisis. It's only a crisis. Questions, comments, concerns.